Hello my friends and welcome once again to this Red Gaming Tech video of myself and Marta. Hope you guys are having a good Saturday. I am here as always with the latest news from the tech and gaming world as of the last 24 or so hours. And today is of course the 7th of November. We have a very console focused video for you today with some extra stuff thrown in. But we are going to start off today's proceedings with some news from AMD. So, what we actually have here is a listing for a Ryzen 7 5700U in a laptop. And this was listed by Amazon Italy and then very helpfully posted about by the guys over at videocards.com. You can, of course, find a link to their article in the description below this video. So, this is one of the first products that is powered by the Ryzen 5000 APUs, which we are expecting to see announced at CES 2021. And... Ryzen 5000 APUs are going to feature both Zen 2 and Zen 3, but this particular part is a Lucien U part, which makes it a Renoir refresh. So obviously based on Zen 2. In terms of specifications for the actual APU, we are we are seeing excuse me eight cores, sixteen threads, a base clock of one point eight gigahertz, and a boost of four point three. And we are also expecting to see eight GPU compute units clocked up to one point nine gigahertz. Now. Amazon Italy were pretty swift to take down the pre-order option and also remove the pricing from this particular listing, but not before the guys over at Video Cards actually took a screenshot. So we can see that the entire laptop does cost €779 Euros and was initially supposed to ship in February 2021. So it would make sense that we can expect Acer, excuse me, and we said Asus, to unveil their new series of AMD laptops at CES 2021, but of course... Well, we'll have to wait and see for that one. And now we're going to move on to the bulk of our video, which is very focused on the PS5, but we do have some gaming news at the end. Um, and we're going to begin with our first topic. Now, of course, it is mere days before the PS5 launches in the United States and just under two weeks before it launches here in the UK as well. So naturally, more information is coming thick and fast about the next generation console. Now, according to IGN Italia, Sony have officially confirmed that sadly, the PlayStation 5 will not support 1440p. Now, it can output in up to 8K, but 1440p is not going to be one of the resolutions that the console actually supports. Now, just to be clear, this is at least at launch. You know, we don't know what future updates are coming or anything like that. Sony may, of course, eventually enable it on the PS5, but they didn't make they didn't make any mention, excuse me, of this to IGN Italia. Now, sadly, they didn't give a reason as to why they aren't supporting 1440p. The reason is probably because you know you're most likely going to be playing a PS5 on a television, whatever size, whatever resolution, whatever make. It's probably going to be a TV. In some cases, you might get people plugging it into a monitor, especially if they're capturing for streams and so on and so on. But in most cases, it's going to be a TV, and there just aren't that many 1440p TVs. But there are, of course, many, many, many 1440p monitors. So, sadly, at least at launch, we will not be seeing 1440p being supported. And speaking of things not being supported, we're going to move on now to expandable SSD storage. Now, obviously, we all know that the PS5 is going to support expandable uh, SSD storage. That's something that Sony have detailed at length during their Road to PS5 event. But it has now been confirmed to The Verge, and of course, you can find a link to their article in the description below, that sadly, this is, quote, reserved for a future update. Now, this shouldn't really come as a huge surprise because Mark Cerny himself did say during the Road to PS5 event that support for expandable SSDs was likely to be a bit past the launch. And he said, quote, it'd be great if that happened by launch, but it's likely to be a bit past it. So please hold off on getting the M.2 drive until you hear from us. Okay, I'm sure you're going like, what? Why? Like, you know, what is the reason? Well... Basically, the answer is, is that not all M.2 SSDs are fast enough to keep up with the PS5 and thin enough to fit in the little slot that it has in the bay or compatible with the PS5 itself. Now, obviously, we have seen officially compatible uh, M.2 SSDs revealed, but not a huge amount of them. So we are going to be seeing support for these SSDs basically held off 
until there is a good selection, I'm assuming, of M.2 SSDs that can actually run fast enough for the PS5 because Sony suggested that off the shelf CCDs would need to, um, CCDs, SSDs, excuse me, sorry, it's been a long day, um, would need to deliver more than 5.5 gigabytes second of bandwidth over a PCIe 4 connection and not have a giant heatsink so that it wouldn't actually fit into the drive bay of the PS5. Thankfully though, the game sizes for the launch games are not actually too obscene other than Black Ops Cold War. 133 gigabytes. Sweet Jesus, oh lord, he coming. <laughs> Jeez. But outside of that, they're much more manageable size. Sackboy is 32 gigs, Miles Morales 50 gigs. Uh, the Ultimate Edition, which comes with Spider-Man Remastered, is also pretty hefty, 105 gigs, and Demon's Souls is 66 gigabytes. So, if you are installing all of those games, that is half your storage gone. Like, but, you know, who's going to have Miles Morales and Miles Morales Ultimate Launch Edition? Nobody is the answer. So, obviously, this is a real shame to be honest, but given what Sony back said back in the road to PS5, this is not a huge surprise. But speaking of PS5 games and storage, we do have some interesting comments up next. Now obviously, PS5 has a really, really nice feature in that it supports backwards compatible games, and one thing the PS5 will support from day one is USB external storage. So. If you don't want to load up your PS5 with PS4 backwards compatible games because you're trying to save space for Call of Duty Black Ops because it is just insanely huge, you can of course store them on an external hard drive. Now you can obviously use that to play PS4 titles not sold on the next gen console, but PS5 games can't be moved to an external hard drive in order to free up space and that is according to a report from GameSpot. Now this coupled with the fact that the PS5 reserves roughly 20% of its storage for operating functions and that leaves around 664 gigabytes usable for software, this is a little bit of a kick in the teeth. Especially in combined, in combination, excuse me, I should say, with the fact that it won't support expandable SSD storage at launch. Now obviously, I think a lot of people are not going to have every launch game. You know, a lot of people are just going to pick up one, two, you know, in most cases. I'm not even getting my PS5 on launch day because I didn't get in fast enough, sadly. So, but even if I was, I would most likely just be doing one game at a time. Demon Souls first, then probably Spider-Man Miles Morales after that. And then, you know, if further down the line space becomes an issue, I'll uninstall some stuff. I mean, I've been doing that on the PS4 since I got it. So, it is a bit of a pain that PS5 games can't be moved to an external storage, but... It does make sense, especially, say for example, that you're playing Ratchet and Clank. That sort of portal mechanic that it has, where it's, you know, pulling you into this portal and then rapidly loading this next area. Obviously that can't happen if it's stored on a HDD, because it's reading it off the HDD and that will massively slow down the load times. So that, that it does make sense, it's just an extra frustration on top of what I've already said. Now obviously the support for storing the PS4 games on external hard drives does mean that the expandable SSDs not being supported at launch isn't as big of a deal, because that's what could eat up space if you were just reinstalling a PS4 game on there uh, alongside your PS5 games in order to replay it uh, with any improvements in frame rate, etc. And it's not like storage is a unique problem for Sony, because obviously, you know, Microsoft, uh, there's one terabyte on the Xbox Series X, 802 gigabytes usable, and there's 364 gigs usable on the Xbox Series S, and the expansion cards are a touch pricey, and obviously the games are going to be still pretty chonky on the Xbox Series X as well. Still frustrating that we are going to be seeing the expandable SSD supported at launch, but there is a small silver lining at least, but... Let's just hope it isn't too long before we see them being supported. Thankfully though, Sony did release some instructional videos, um, tips to get you started and that sort of thing, including transferring data from PS5, PS4 excuse me, to the next-gen system, so save files and things like that, so you don't have to necessarily start a PS4 game from scratch if you're moving over to the PS5 if you're in the middle of a playthrough or whatever, which is always nice. I have started playing Ghost of Tsushima on my PS4, but... Uh, it's actually got some nice improvements on PS5, so I'm going to hold off on playing any more uh, until I get the PS5, just so I can transfer the save file and just carry on playing the game with a bit of a higher frame rate, because that is the only real downside to that game so far, is uh, on the PS4, 
You know, it runs fine, but obviously at a higher frame rate, I'm always going to take that option when it's available. But we're going to move on now to some very interesting comments from Ubisoft regarding the next gen. Now these comments came from Galvin Whitlock, the lead programmer over on Watch Dogs Legion. And they spoke to WCCF Tech in an interview, and of course you can find a link to their uh, article, excuse me, in the description below this video. And he essentially touched on the challenges presented by next-gen consoles for, from both Sony and Microsoft, and how it's going to affect the way they develop games, essentially. And he said, quote, there are a lot of restrictions that we have to work with to make large open world games run on a HDD. Being able to load our models and textures with true random access and with a more just-in-time approach will allow us to fill the memory with things you're seeing on screen now, rather than the ones you may be seeing soon. This will have a big impact on the visual variety and complexity of the world we can create. For Watch Dogs Legion, we have been working very closely with our first party partners to make sure loading times were fully optimised. In the future, a re-architecture of the way we make open world games will allow us to go even further in how we take advantage of new consoles' hardware innovations. I'm impressed with the increased CPU capabilities of the next-gen consoles. We want to make more complex simulations and give more life to the worlds we create. All of this takes CPU power, and we are looking forward to making our AI, animation and physics simulations more real and involving. I really want to see players' actions have more and more impact on the game world and the people in it. We've only just started with ray tracing hardware, we're going to continue to use it to make the lighting more dynamic and real. It's a period of innovation, and I'm excited to see what novel approaches we can take with this hardware. And yeah, some very very interesting points and some very true points you know obviously the launch games are using the hardware obviously but are they really fully taking advantage of them i mean of course not it always takes developers time to learn the new systems to really get to grips with all the tips and tricks and how to squeeze all the ounce of power and obviously we've got some pretty interesting changes in how the consoles work and compared to last gen that obviously, you know, require developers to think a bit more and can perhaps be a bit more creative, thanks to the SSDs in both systems. It's going to change open world games pretty massively, but it's not just going to be the big games cutting down on loading screens that's going to be the main thing. You know, we're going to see more games like Ratchet and Clank, where we're seeing, you know, portal mechanics and quick loading times of those no areas and things like the medium, we've got the dual reality gameplay you know, more games like that that use this tech in interesting ways to do gameplay that we just could not have seen previously on the current generation consoles. I'm really excited, to be honest, to see what the next generation brings for us. You know, I'm, I'm looking forward to the launch, you know, whenever I end up getting my PS5, I'm going to have, you know, a great time playing Demon's Souls and all the other games I'm interested in. But as much as I'm looking forward to playing all the launch titles and all the games that have been pushed back to next year and all the games in the future... I am just excited to see how developers use these new technologies in innovative ways on both systems. And I want to see how each console can be really fully utilized with its you know, unique properties and how developers really take advantage of those for their games. It's going to be interesting. It's a TLDR. But we're going to finish today's proceedings with some good news from, from Mass Effect fans. This is a confirmation that a new Mass Effect is already in development. And this particular announcement was supposed to come during N7 Day, but apparently GameSpot did a bit of an oopsie and revealed the announcement earlier than intended, and we've seen this posted about on the Reset Era forums. Now, sadly, details are very thin on the ground. We are going to be seeing more details in the future as we go on, I'm sure. But the main thing to take away is that a new main entry in the Mass Effect franchise is officially in development and is being worked on by a veteran team within Bioware. Now, of course, the Legendary Edition, which has also been revealed by GameSpot ahead of the official announcement, will be released in 2021, and is, of course, going to have 1, 2, and 3 on there with better resolution and frame rates, as well as better textures, shaders, character models, and effects. Now, a lot of people were very, very disappointed in Mass Effect Andromeda. It was very rough around the edges, especially at launch. Now, some of those issues were resolved, but a lot of people were pretty disappointed with the game. Now, to be honest with you, I have only played Mass Effect 1. I know, right? <laughs> no real reason behind it. I just got into them very late. I played the first Mass Effect on console, and I just have never played the rest of the games. There's just, just there's so many games coming out, and I just never made time for them. So I think the Legendary Edition is definitely going to be on my list to pick up, because, you know, 
I enjoyed Mass Effect 1 a lot. Uh, it was a little bit janky. Some of the gameplay hadn't aged particularly well, but it was sort of a really good game. And I could see why it was so popular. So I'm really looking forward to the Legendary Edition, see if it comes, well, when it comes out, excuse me, and getting it with better frame rate and stuff is always a bonus. And curious to see what the new Mass Effect game is and if they can restore the good name of Mass Effect in the eyes of gamers. Anyway, that is me done for this video. Thank you so much for watching. As always, your support is highly appreciated. Do remember to like and subscribe if you haven't done so already. And I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.